This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. Hey, it's James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. And in this episode, I'm going to be talking to Hugh McLeod, who is a very successful cartoonist and author on the subject of creativity. And we speak about talent and stamina and its role in creativity, about asking what problem are you solving on, in your creative work, and finally, the role of art within corporate culture. So let's get into the show. Hey, it's James Taylor, and I'm really excited today to have a gentleman who uh, I absolutely love um, uh, his book that I picked up a couple of years ago, which was called Ignore Everybody. And his name is Hugh McLeod. And Hugh it worked as an advertising copywriter in Chicago and New York for more than a decade while developing his skills as a cartoonist. Perhaps best known for his Hugh cards and company Gaping Void, Hugh is also an extremely skilled marketer and speaker. Millions have read his popular manifesto, How to Be Creative, and his book, Ignore Everybody, is one of the best books you're going to find out there on the subject of creativity. So, Hugh, welcome to the show. Hello. How are you? Hi, good, James. Good, good. And so, share with our listeners what's going on in your world just now. Oh, work. <laughs> no, I, uh, I'm a co-founder. Well, I founded a blog uh, 15 years ago called Gaping Void, which is me publishing my cartoons, and then with the help of my now business partner and co-founder, uh, Jason Corman, we turned Gaping Void into a company which uses art to affect outcomes inside uh, large companies. So it's, it's very, it has a very kind of culture, it has a very kind of corporate culture thing we do. And we, we're very interested in how art transforms culture and how culture, trans, helping to change culture inside companies actually kind of helps the bottom line, and that's what we focus on. Uh, and I guess I'm creative director, but the company has a lot more than going on than just me. I mean, there's a lot of other stuff to go on, but I'm kind of like the uh, the cartoon. I'm, I'm the main cartoonist and the main writer on, 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 on in the company. So, how did so, where, where did your your craft as a a, a cartoonist start from? Because I mentioned you were you're involved in kind of big kind of advertising copywriting. Yeah. Uh, oh, that goes back forever. I mean, I, I always, I always doodled. I always drew. And you know, in, in, I went to school in Scotland, like yourself, and they told me not to draw, but I carried on anyways. <laughs> uh, and I started publishing cartoons in the local papers when I went to school in Texas, uh, and that was fine. But I never thought I'd make any money doing it, so I went and got a job in advertising uh, in Chicago, New York, like like you said. And I liked advertising for a while because it kind of had this kind of creative thing, but it was also kind of engaged in the real world. Uh, and that's kind of, I guess, been my my thing, I suppose, is figuring out, well, how do you make art that's relevant to the real world, I suppose? How do you make art that keeps you engaged with the real world? Because, I mean, if you go to an art gallery and look at art, most art's made in, like, real isolation. You know, there's a guy in the studio... Uh, in, in silence, you know, <laughs> and I never like the iso- I, I I never like the isolated part of the uh, the art thing. So I wanted something. I wanted to kind of create, you know, I wanted to create art that allowed me to live in the real world, like work in the office, not just be an artist. I suppose. And and you're, uh, you're known for these, uh, you know, the, these great. Um, initially, it was from the the Hugh cards as well. Yes. people got go on the site as well. And you became again, very well known, and a lot of people yes, turned turn, turn, turn me on to. And I think we met many years ago at Blog World. We we yeah. were talking with a lot of bloggers as well. So you 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 do these cards about lots of different areas, and obviously a lot of them are around business. But where where do you get some of your your new ideas? Where do they come from? Well, I think th- I think the the uh, the ideas come from the the reality of having to stay alive and also make a living, <laughs> which is is interesting because you know when you think a lot of um, artists and you think of the word commercial, th- those are things that are often you don't think that they kind of go together all the time. But you you sit in an interesting place of being a commercial artist in that sense. 
Well, not just uh, uh, well, everybody has to make a living, even artists. I mean, I think we have this kind of idea that artists are somehow separate from it all. Uh, but the thing is, we all have to survive. We all have to not just make money, but we all have to, you know, eat food, and we have to enjoy our lives. And we all have we all have stuff we want to do. We all want to uh, have relationships. We all want to have spend time with our kids. We all want to have time to read, and you know, and just get on with our lives. But we also have to make a living. And and this uh, this tension is you know between making a living and doing everything else is the great conflict, not a great conflict, but the great dynamic of our lives. I think. And I guess my work comes out of that, you know, where the, uh, you know, where do we, where do we get meaning from work? See, see, this is what I noticed a long time ago, where I think this is true a generation ago, where you have a life, you know, wife, house, kids, and then you get a job to pay for that life. <laughs> the fact that you're spending more time at your job than you are with your quote unquote life is is neither here nor there. Actually, what happens is actually your, your work life is your life as well. Mm. And so instead of there being work-life balance, to me, there's kind of work-life integration. How do, you make, how do you make your work part of your life? And without it, at the same time, still being able to you know, be a good husband, be a good father, be a good wife, whatever. And that's, I guess that's, where I get, that's what's interesting to me. You know, why, do, why do people do what they do? Why do, why do Why is it so important that what they have to do requires them to be in a car for two hours a day? Uh, what are the choices people make? Why do people sacrifice everything? Oh, excuse me, telephone. What, you know, why do people sacrifice everything to, why do people sacrifice their, their, their families in order to be, in order for their career? Why do people sacrifice their career in order to save their family? I mean, what, what motivates people? What, what, so I guess the choices we make as adults is the, uh, the, uh, the main driver of my work. Plus, you know, the fact, the fact that we're all mortal. We all have a very limited time to do it in. And you mentioned something in, in, uh, in Ignore Everybody about this idea of keeping your day job. So there's this, there's a, this notion of um, people that maybe well, they're working a nine-to-five job um, maybe it's something that they're it's not they're not 100 percent inspired to do but it, it pays it pays the bills um, and they have maybe an idea in their head of this great dramatic gesture of going in on monday morning handing in the notice and then just saying that's i'm, I'm going to be an artist and just going yeah. from zero to 100 straight away and and you kind of you had an interesting take on that yeah it, mostly because mainly it never works as well as you think it's going to do <laughs> the the idea of uh you know, the great Spanish explorer Cortez is famous for burning his ships when he arrived in the new, in the new world. Say, so we either go forward or we die. And yes, you can do that. Um, but the, the, thing, the thing is, I, I just never thought that was a very effective way to do it. To me, if you want to write a book, don't quit your day job. What you do is you get up an hour early and you write your book an hour. You know, you steal time. You, you wake up an hour earlier than everybody else and you start writing, you know, before everybody else gets out of bed. And then you do 300 pages a day or 300 words a day. And after, you know, w- within a year, you have your first novel. You don't have to, you don't have to quit your, your, your responsibilities in order to do that. Uh, so I'm a great advocate of stealing time from your normal life rather than trying to go from, like you say, zero to 100 from day one. I, I think that's kind of... And how did you do it with the Hue cards in, in those kind of early days where you, uh, you were just starting to get the blog up and going? And um... I, was, I was freelancing as a copywriter. You know, I, I, well, I had, I, well, that's not, when I, got, when I first started in the cards, I mean, I, you know, I'd go, to, I'd go to my day job as an advertising guy, and then after work, I'd go to a coffee shop or a bar or whatever and draw, as opposed to going home and watching Monday Night Football. You know, it was just a, I spent a lot of time after work, working. I didn't spend a lot of time, you know, uh, playing pool <laughs> or what, what do people do in New York after work, you know, <laughs> you know going to see movies, going, I mean, I, I did a little bit of that, but I also, I also had this idea there's a main prize. Uh, and, and at that point, was it, was the, was the prize to, 
um, just be able to transition from doing all the copywriting stuff just so you were doing the the, the cartooning full time? Did you have an idea of, you know, how you were going uh, to commercial I, or, 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 you know, if it was going to be a commercial thing to, be, to do the cartooning? I, I didn't think I didn't think that the, the cartoons were at first. I didn't think the cartoons were going to lead anywhere. I thought that I was doing them for myself. But if I did them for myself, I'd continue to grow and something good would happen eventually. It wasn't like when I quit my advertising job and go do this. It's more like uh, the more I do these cartoons, the more interesting my life will become, in, directly or indirectly. Uh, I was quite happy in advertising for a while. I mean, it was it wasn't a it was I wasn't particularly good at it, but I mean, I liked I liked the lifestyle. I mean, I liked. <laughs> I liked having an office. I liked having a salary. I liked hanging out with adults and solving problems. That was quite nice. I, I think uh, it, the only the only trouble the only trouble with advertising, if you're a copywriter, is uh, you know your client loses your 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 company you work for loses the client. You get laid off, and all of a sudden you have to start from ground you have to start from ground zero again. And, you, and every time you do that, it gets harder and harder. To one day, <laughs> you, one day you're in your forties and nobody wants to hire you because you're just, you know you're quote unquote too old. And so, um, yeah, I, did, I just felt I just felt that if you want to be creative. The way to do that is just to be creative, you know, and make make time for it rather than, you know, make these big heroic gestures where you give up everything. And you also mentioned the book, this thing, which which I've seen time and day. I, you know, in my in previous lives, I've been involved a lot on creating a lot of online music schools. And um, yeah, and something I was always really intrigued about was. A lot of people would sign up to online courses um, in music and or, or, or subscribe to um, learning an instrument around big birthdays. And you mentioned something about uh, you, uh, you, about crayons um, yeah. in the book, which I thought was I thought really spoke to maybe what was kind of going on in people's minds why they why they would want to start investing back in their creativity at a certain point in their lives. Yeah, I, I said. Uh... You know, being a lot of people are hit w w whatever age they are, when they're about thirty or they have a midlife crisis or thirty five or forty or whatever. They, they all of a sudden they get the creative bug again after suppressing it for twenty years or ten years. Because what what happens is you're you know when you're a kid you're doing all that kind of kid stuff you know going to school and playing around and stuff, and then, and then by the time you 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 know you do your exams and go to go to university and leave university you're so sick of being a kid. You know, you quite like working. You quite like having a job. <laughs> you know, getting paid, having your own money. You know, being in the adult world, and then so you, you kind of go do that for a while. But that gets a grind after a while, and after a while, you remember all this the fun stuff you used to do before you got so busy, and it starts to nag you, and eventually you say, "Well, I want to do it again." And uh, because you know, it's great to work for a living. It's great to make a living, but it's if all you're doing is making money, then you know your life gets quite dull. And then how long can your life be dull for before, you know, your soul starts to rebel? And so I, I started thinking, well, when you get hit by the creative bug, it's just like, it's just like I said, it's your wee voice inside you saying, I'd like my crayons back. And then you go back into play mode because, you know, playing is actually how we get anything done. We, we play with things and then they turn into stuff. We don't, we don't, we don't get stuff done. Real, real innovation doesn't come from beating ourselves up or driving ourselves harder. It comes from stepping back and playing with stuff. I mean, if you ever, if you ever uh, look at scientists, they have the time in their lives, you know, just kind of messing around with test tubes or, you know, mathematical theorem or whatever. Experimenting. Experiment. Experimenting is very playful. Yeah. It's not like this, I got to get, you know, it's not results driven. It's kind of more of a kind of, hey, let's see what happens. It's, it's very improvisational. You don't, you don't, you don't improvise really. True, impro true improvisation doesn't really happen with result with the result already in your head. You know, true impro true innovation comes from impro imp improvising, and improvising is kind of a leap of faith, I think. And you know, in those those early days when you were first starting to do the cards, and you started getting success from it. Uh, you know, some people said to you, you know, this this whole business card thing is like really simple. Aren't you worried about someone just ripping <laughs> ripping your, your off? And, and I you, wasn't. And your I response was, well, 
Only if they can draw more of them than me, better than me. <laughs> and and your your take was you just said ninety percent of what separates successful people and failed people is time, e- effort, and stamina as well. Um, so this 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 idea of persistence in what you're doing, where, where, yeah. where does that sit around creativity? Uh, yeah, talent, stamina, and discipline, the, the, the holy grail. Uh, well, I, I think I think the creative. I think I think uh, you know to get paid as a creative. Certainly, you know you have to have outputs, uh, and, and and I think you have to. Uh, you know, you have you have to have a discipline where you're, you're constantly producing, uh, and you have to. You know, it's not like oh, everything. You know, it's not like it's not like uh, you know, going to the bathroom where it just comes to you when it comes to you, <laughs> and you just you know, you kind of you have to kind of you kind of have to work at it. You have to practice at it, and uh, and this idea that if you're creative, you have to work less. No, I'd say you actually probably have to work more because. A, you have to you have to come up with all the ideas that are going to make you money, <laughs> but B, you also have to come up with all the ideas that are going to be rejected as well, and that's very time consuming. <laughs> and unfortunately, it's like the advertising thing: fifty percent of money in advertising is wasted. We just don't know which fifty percent. <laughs> well, it's not just that. It's like uh, you know, there's you know, ninety percent inspiration, ten percent inspiration. You know, what is it? Yeah, the, ed- yeah, the Edison quote: ninety-nine percent yeah. uh, perspiration. That's true, but there's also you spend a lot of time keeping your ideas alive, getting you know, defending your ideas. In other words, you know, before this book gets published, there's going to be like six or seven editors out there who are going to try to kill it, <laughs> and you're going to have to get that project around them, and you're going to have to go, you're going to have to circumnavigate them. You know, you're going to have to get a lot of rejection. You're going to have a lot of people inside your organization who are going to say, "Well, I don't like that idea," and then you have to defend your idea, and then you have to make alliances inside your organization or inside your network in order to get the thing made. And that's very time consuming as well. And, uh, there's a kind of idealized romantic version of the artist is some guy who just sits in his car, just like, you know, cranking out stuff whenever he feels like and getting paid. It doesn't work that way. It's like a lot of behind the scenes work, you know, you know, making sure there's somebody on the other end who, who, is going to buy it, making sure there's somebody in the other end who's going to fill up all the holes that you can't yourself. You, you, you know, it's very, it's very, to get to uh, get a uh, a piece of work from the, you know, the initial piece of inspiration to, you know, to the customer or to the client or to the patron, and then get you know money in your pocket. It's quite complicated, and that takes up a lot of time. So, and some, some, that's something that you're. You know, I know a lot of people really respect the kind of work that you do because you you market what you do in a non um, a non icky way. You 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 seem to have you. I think you're actually a very skilled marketer um, in terms of how you kind of get your your what you're trying to do out there. How you talk about building your network, uh, how you do it in such a way that it it doesn't feel people are being sorted because you're, you're, you're sharing your, you're sharing your work in a, in a way that feels very authentic as well. So can, can yeah. you talk about from, from a perspective as, as an artist as well, your approach to, to marketing? Uh, my, my approach to marketing is, is, I always start off not so much like, well, what do I want to make? Or, I mean, I want to make the work I want to make. I mean, there's that. But in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, well, okay, what problem of somebody else's am I actually solving? And, or what problem, what problem are we, you know, the, me and the team, are we actually solving? And that's how we got into kind of, you know, co- corporate culture work because that's a real problem inside organizations. Uh, organizations don't have an art problem. They have a corporate culture problem. So we kind of go, okay, well, how can art help corporate culture? Uh, and so we're solving a real problem. Then, you, then your, your next step is say, okay, well, who has this problem? Okay, where are they? <laughs> how can they be reached? And that's fairly straightforward because, uh, you know, I had a friend, an uh, English friend of mine who's a tailor. And uh, and I got him blogging, you know, 
10, 12 years ago. So I thought, hey, a tailor who blog would be really neat. And I, I said, okay, this guy can only make 100 suits a year. So realistically, one, let's say 1% of his client base is going to buy from him. That means he only needs 10,000 readers for his blog, and that's fairly doable. As opposed to, so there's, there's an idea of, well, you know, how, so there, there, to me, there's like a 10,000 person rule there of how big the network has to be. And, you know, 10,000 10, is pretty, pretty doable. So a little bit like, you know, the kind of the thousand fans concept yeah, is extrapolated yeah. out. Yeah. And it's like, uh, and so this idea of, well, what, you know, who actually needs me, what do I need, and how do I find them, as opposed to how do I get famous? Because that's, that's never-ending. That's like, that's, 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 you're just hoping to be discovered by the big fame god, you know, like, like Kim Kardashian or something. You're hoping to go viral, and that's not really anything you can control. But you say to yourself, well, if you say to yourself, well, there's, you know, 15, I just need to reach 15 Spanish-speaking architects who have a, who like flamenco guitar. <laughs> <laughs> then that's much easier to find, if that makes any sense. So you kind of, you kind of like narrow your search by, you know, the bigger the problem you're trying to solve, the easier it is to find the people who are in the, uh, in the market for that. Whereas if you're just trying to like get random people that you never met in places you've never been, to give you money arbitrarily well then you need to be kim kardashian but and then so once you've you've identified you know what problem am i trying to solve with my art with like yeah. with whatever i'm trying to do and then you then say well who are those people where do they hang out where do they spend time yeah uh, that, that the next thing that kind of happens after that is in terms of what type of thing i should be how I should be helping them and helping solve their problems that are maybe related right. to the thing that I do. I think that's where a lot of people maybe get stuck because there's all, it seems to be, you know, every month there's a new bright, shiny thing to, you know, mm -hmm. to, to whether it's, you know, webinars or whether it's uh, whatever the, the latest flavor of the, of the month is as well. Um, how do you go, go about thinking about the kind of free stuff, the free content you have to put out there in order to get these people interested in what you're doing? It's, you see, it's great. Let's okay. Let, we're, we're talking about fine art, okay? Forget about all the other things you could classify me as. But if if your if if your business plan is to be the next Andy Warhol, well, that's great. But that requires a lot of stuff happening that's way out of your control. You know, being in the right place at the right time historically, and then being discovered by the right collectors by the right gallery in New York, and you know, being better than the other 50,000 artists in New York trying to break into the same space. You see what I mean? And that's, that's great. You want to do it, but guess what? It, it's, uh, you're not the first one to think of that. And so there's a lot of variables, you know, outside your, outside your control. Whereas, uh, you know, what I did was I say, well, you know, who likes my stuff? Okay. You know, people in business with a certain worldview. Okay. How many are, there aren't that many of those people out there, so they're pretty easy to reach. And then, and then also, not only do they have to have a certain, re not only do they have a certain worldview that's pretty rare, they also have to have pretty senior positions in large companies because that's they're the people who make decisions about my work. About you know that they're the people who can actually make a decision. Yes, let's hire this guy or let's hire Gabe Boyd. Uh, so, so instead of worrying about the six billion people out there who may buy my T-shirt, I just worry about the you know, you know, fifty or sixty people out there who might realistically want to you know go this business. And, and you know, going after a target market of fifty people is much easier than going after a target market of six billion. And and in terms of the the free stuff, I mean, I remember when we first met at Blog World, and you were kind of you were kind of obviously getting known, and uh, there was there was there was some buzz kind of going on as well. So you were kind of putting out through the blog a lot of you know, um, uh, artwork that you were creating, uh, no one was paying, paying you for it. You were just kind of putting it out there and it was funny and it was insightful and it, it changed yeah, your audience yeah. as well. So yeah. but you, you, but you must have had a plan at that point saying, well, how in the hell am I going to monetize this thing? Cause I can put out lots of, you know, um, great art and great content for free, but there must be some way that I can actually capture some of that value. Yeah. I, I call it leaving a trail of breadcrumbs, right? So you, you kind of, 
So you put out stuff. I, we, we have a we have a newsletter which you know goes out five times a week, and it has a a cartoon, and then a uh, like a blog post. Then it has a writing, which is about some something you know something to do with uh, our business, and then we send that out to the list, and then hopefully they like it, and they you know they show it to their friends, or they show it to their boss, or they show it to their subordinates. Uh, it gets passed around, so the next time they have. So they, they know about it, and then let's say they're next time they're having a meeting in the, you know conference table, and they go, well, we have we have this event coming up, and we have this problem needing solved. One of our subscribers will be in the room, will raise their hand and go, hey, I know this guy in Miami, you know, or I know Ga- have you have you checked out Gabe and Void? Maybe he can help us, or maybe you know they can help us, and then so it's a way of it's a way of you know, keeping our name out there, and but but also it's. Uh, it's a daily gift giving. We go, hey, this is what you know. This is what we're thinking about. Hey, we're, this is what I'm thinking about. Uh, this is what matters to us. And so it's kind of, kind of con- a, con- a constant stream, rather than although we do other social media, we're not waiting for it to go viral. If that makes any sense? Hmm. Yeah. Like, oh, we need a viral because you know. And I've had stuff go viral before that you know led nowhere. Just a lot of people who didn't care saw it and went, yeah, whatever, but then forgot about it two seconds later. Whereas, you know, I, I want people who are going to pay attention and keep paying attention. And something else you mentioned about, you know, your idea with, with, the, with the business cards and then, you know, and actually it's more than the business cards, obviously, in terms of what, you, what you're doing as well. But you mentioned that the more original your idea is, the less good advice other people will be able to give you. Yeah, and yeah, I, th- I thought that was quite. In- I thought that was quite insightful because you know people are often getting started out on things and they have this idea and it's kind of off a little bit off the wall and it's it's unusual. It hasn't really been done before in that kind of, this kind of way, and they go out there to get their advice and they and they get stuck a little bit. Yeah, because because it's like it hasn't been tested. If that makes any sense. Hmm. Uh, uh, I mean, I was thinking about like about you know, if you went up to your your parents in twenty five years ago and said, "Yeah, no, I'm just gonna like not be a lawyer. Instead, I'm just gonna open up a burrito bar." They'll go, "Why would anybody want to open up a burrito bar when they could have a job at a law firm?" Well, that was the guy from uh, Chipotle. You know, he said he went to cooking school. He said, "Well, I want to open a restaurant, but I need money. Okay, how how do I make money? Well, I, I need a business. Okay, well, I, you know, I bet I could get eat people. I get, I bet I, I could get people to eat burritos. And so he, he started selling burritos in Denver, <laughs> based on the burritos he saw in uh, San Francisco. So he brought San Francisco burritos to Denver, and now he he sells millions of them every day. <laughs> but there wasn't any kind of like if you if you hung out with his, his you know his chef friends." Or the people he went to school with, or his high school buddies, or his family, they would have thought he was nuts. So, because there was no burrito Zen master type right. of <laughs> master that yeah. point. So, who, who do you like for you when you were kind of you were in those kind of early stages? Who did you have around you if you if you knew there was maybe no one that could really help you with exactly the kind of thing you wanted? But do you have other people around you as as a form of just kind of getting feedback on what you were doing? And yeah, yeah. Well, I, in the beginning, no. I mean, I had some, you know, my colleagues in advertising, and they thought, well, that's cool. But the, th- the thing is, the thing about the, the, the cue cards, I was just like doing them for myself. So it didn't really matter what they thought. You know, I wasn't trying to sell them. I was just trying to do them just to give me something to do for my own amusement. Uh, and then and then my current business partner, you know, co- you know Gabe Lloyd co-founder, Jason Corman, well, he hired me as a client. When I was doing my freelance, and we just kind of, uh, he had a wine business at the time. And we just started uh, riffing together. And so he was, he had a lot of, you know, business news, and I had a lot of creative news. And we kind of married the two together. And then when he sold his wine company, we just started printing, you're publishing art together. And publishing art was fine, but, you know, it wasn't, you know, the thing is people actually don't really want, you know, the thing about buying art is it's very hard. It wasn't solving anybody's problem, you know? It's like, well, so we decided to go into more of a kind of problem-solving idea rather than just like, who wants to buy my print idea? Uh, 
no, there wasn't. There wasn't. There wasn't like a lot of. There wasn't like a lot of encouragement in the early days. It was just. But the thing is, it was. It wasn't like I was trying to raise thirty million dollars to make a movie. You know, I didn't have to. Sell, I didn't have to pre-sell it. I just made it. And, you know. You know, put them in a shoebox. Yeah, them you're go. just making them getting them out there, and yeah. uh, I mean, so um, when as you were kind of going through this journey, can you relay any any insights or any kind of light bulb moments on this journey? Where you yeah. went, oh, okay, yeah. this is what yeah. I need to be doing. Yeah. This is how I need to be doing. Or this is the, yeah. the way I need to. I, I, I have the moment. I, it's a it's a ten thousand person moment. It came about fifteen years ago. This is before I met Jason. Uh where I thought, well, no one's ever going to make me famous because, you know, the New Yorker, they're not going to publish my work. You know, Hollywood's never going to call me up. You know, uh, the advertising business is never going to, like, recognize me very much. Uh, no, you know, I'm, no one's ever going to, the New York's ever going to phone me up and make me famous. So I'm never going to be discovered. But I thought, you know, if I if I got ten thousand people a year to give me money, I could make a living. You know, sell a T-shirt to ten thousand people, sell a book to ten thousand people. Uh, if I could find ten thousand people who want to give me money a year, then I could uh, I could make a living, and it wouldn't really matter whether you know I got a review in the New York Times or not. <laughs> yeah, and I said I could do that on the internet, and so that's kind of what I started out doing. So we're, uh, we're almost kind of going back to this, this idea of of patronage, it, it, but just in a much more distributed and 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 dispersed way than than maybe Mozart or it, Beethoven or the. Well, it wasn't like become a patron of Huma Cloud. It was more of a. But they were getting become, value. They were getting. Become, be, be, become a become a fan. Become a customer. You yeah. know, become one of the guys who, you know, who wants who wants who wants to buy my next book. I mean, same as any author or any you know. Just get a thousand. I, I know there's the uh, thousand true fan thing, but I thought that ten thousand is more realistic, and I thought ten thousand was doable. You know, you, you get a. And uh, I mean, what happened in the end is we instead of like selling, you know, ten thousand what units a year. I mean, we do do that. We do sell a lot of art, but I mean, uh, you know, we we concentrate more on like high high value. Services like you know consulting, consulting and change you know change management. Uh, so, so that figure then only needs to be a, a couple of hundred or a hundred, you know, for a couple of dozen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It doesn't have to be very many at all. It needs you know usually we have, yeah, we have a, f- a few big products on the boil for like people like Microsoft or uh, you know uh, do do a lot of stuff for Rackspace, you know, people like that. Uh, but we also have we also sell a lot of art. That goes out every day, and that ends up on people's walls, and that makes a lot of people happy. And whether they turn into long-term corporate clients later down the road doesn't really matter. It's making people happy, but it's also, you know, a lot of people hang our, our work in offices, so it gets seen. It's not just like in somebody's house. It's yeah. you know, it's seen. It, it, it doesn't go into a vault. And, it doesn't uh, go vault. No. no. <laughs> it's, okay. it's, uh, so if you um, could recommend a, an online resource or tool like Evernote um, to that you really love and you you like using, uh, if you could recommend something like that to one of, to our to our listeners, what what might it be? That's our. That's the platform we uh, send our, oh. our daily newsletter out. Sorry, Hugh, the, the our daily sig- email out. Sorry, the, we send that out to you know, the, the, uh, the signal just dropped there. Could you just go from the from that start where you said what the um, uh, what the tool was? Hi there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it, dro- it dropped sorry. out again. For some reason. So I, I just asked you the question, um, do you have a, an online resource it, or a tool like Evernote that you really love? Ugh. Oh, it keeps dropping. No, we're back again. Yeah. Can you hear me again? Yeah, I can hear you now, Hugh. Okay. 
I like MailChimp, the uh, email engine, the email newsletter engine. That's what we use. Uh, we send out five emails a week with cartoons and cop and content and offers. And uh, we put, that's how we put our ideas out of the ether. And then they get picked up by social media. Uh, we promote the email on social media, and that's kind of feeds the, you know, feeds the whole thing. Uh, that, that's our main thing. That's the thing I like the most. Uh, we use Twitter. We use Facebook, uh, same as everybody else. Uh, but it's the, I think, I think, I think MailChimp's the thing we use to really just, uh, you know, keep our tribe really engaged more so than Twitter or anything else. So that, that's what I'd recommend. Uh, there are other email services out there like A Weber, Constant Contact, but we really like MailChimp. And it's it's funny, you know, when when I speak to a lot of folks within the corporate world or even musicians and things, I say, well, what what kind of moves the needle for them? It, email still is incredibly powerful um, for that. Where with with Twitter, I mean, I love using Twitter, it, but it always feels like a bit of a fire hose of information the whole t- <laughs> the whole time. Yeah, Whereas, you're, but the thing the thing about the thing about uh, the thing about a mail, you know, an email is you've got a permission asset. They they want to hear from you. Yeah, and they're they're it's expected, it's relevant to them. Uh, they can they can delete you anytime, and they will if you don't. They don't like you, and so you have to be very respectful for the relationship. Whereas, uh, you know, it's if somebody does something bogus on Twitter, it's actually most of the time it's more effort than it's worth to unfollow them because you know you're you're too busy not paying attention anyways. <laughs> uh, there, <clears throat> so I mean, Twitter's fine, but I think Twitter's great for broadcast. But it's like, it's it's also everybody else is doing it, and so it's quite. It's a noisy channel. It's very noisy. People aren't really that engaged with it. Uh, I think it's great for breaking news. So it's like some president gets assassinated or something. It's good for that, you know. Or you know, if uh, O.J. Simpson goes to jail or something, that's good for that. I mean, it's good for breaking news, but. Uh, and news is interesting, but how important is news? Ninety-five percent of the day, it's not that important. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's great that, you know, it's great. You know, somebody, I don't know, somebody, some famous celebrity dies, and you tweet it. I mean, okay, Freddie Mercury died, boo-hoo, but so what? Or David Bowie? I mean, I never met the guy. <laughs> it doesn't actually affect my day-to-day life. Very much. You, you've got no way of influencing any of the things there as well, and then it's uh, right, right. It, and it, then you say, "Well," and then you say, "Hey, I just blog." You know, then you broadcast, "Hey, I just wrote this blog post. Go read it, please." Uh, they may, they may not. They they couldn't care less most of the time. I, you know, it's. And it's, how how do, how do people get into your? How, how do most people? get on your email list where where do they come in from is it mostly from the blog which is that is being shared by people who are on the email list already or is it some other way uh I, i'd say i'd say people you know subscribers sharing it with people i think that's probably the most to the kind of word of mouth yeah word of mouth i, I think uh word of mouth is good I, I i mean i we do promote it on twitter and facebook and places uh i guess people find it from there too uh i don't I mean, I like Twitter and I like Facebook. Uh, I think it's getting harder and harder to rely on that. Does that make any sense? It, it, it works when it works. It doesn't. It doesn't when it doesn't. And why spend all your time worrying about it? Yeah. And if you could only recommend one record and one book to our listeners, what what would they be? Uh, one record would be uh, "Kind of Blue" by Miles Davis. It was without question the best jazz record ever made. Uh, it's just, it's just, most jazz records are, yeah, pretty, a lot of them are pretty good. Some of them are excellent, but this one just, just better than all of, all of them. I, I, I don't even know why. It just is. It just, it's great. You just go back. Okay. Uh, a great book to read is uh, War and Peace by Leo, Tolst- Leo, Leo Tol- Tolstoy. Yeah. Because it's just vast and deep and rich and colorful and expansive and beautiful and heartbreaking and wonderful and triumphant and all these big words. <laughs> and, and, then, and then once you re- read it, you realize what real art is as opposed to, you know, 
most of the crap out there. And it's just it's just been actually on on BBC TV. In fact, we were, I was watching it last night. It was the, the concluding episode, and uh, it was Paul Dano um, who was was playing the Pierre character mm-hmm. in it. And uh, at the end of it, what my my overwhelming it was beautifully shot and beautifully filmed. I, I hear it's really good. It's great. It really good. But at the end of it, you do feel slightly shortchanged. It's only six episodes long because right. you feel right. the, the, none of the characters get a chance. And, and I think this is partly due now. We are so used to you know being things like netflix where characters like homeland and things the characters have a long period of time to be developed in a lot of netflix type series now um yeah. you know making a murder i was just watching recently where you see that person and you get to know that person very well where in a in one of these big tv series which only has six episodes um you just don't get you don't get any of the richness yeah. unfortunately of the book well yeah and and uh, the book the book was designed to give you something to do for the next three weeks after, you, you know, while, you know, while you're hanging out in your parlor after dinner with your family, you could just read your book and just keep you busy for a week or two. And as you know, I, I took the first time I read, I've read the book about three or four times. And the first time I did it, I, I just took a week off to read it and I got completely lost in it. And, uh, there's a, a story I heard about some famous duchess who after she finished reading it, she, she went into mourning and wouldn't go out and leave her bedroom for a month because, Your Excellency, why so sad? She says, Because I'll never get to read War and Peace again for the first time ever. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, another good book, oh well, I can read uh, yeah, another good book that was like that was uh, Middlemarch by George Eliot, an English yeah. book. That was a great book. But I think War and Peace, you know, anybody who cares about art and in the written word, has a duty to read that book that that that's the granddaddy it's just, and it's so beautiful and wonderful and and just other books just aren't that good yeah <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a high bar or when you compare you know, you know a kind of blue um the, these are these are very high bars to to put up there as well so and if, 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 if our listeners go very they go to james taylor dot me and uh, just put in Hugh McLeod in the search bar you'll be able to get links to all these things we're talking about and the different tools and and things as well so final question Hugh. let's imagine you woke up tomorrow morning and you had to start from scratch so you've got the tools of your trade which i ma- imagine is a pen and, and paper and the thing the, the tools that you use and the knowledge and the skills you've acquired over the years but no one knows who you are and you have no following how would you restart oh i'd probably uh oh boy boy that's a big question i think uh i think i'd start on twitter and i think i'd start with email i just go crazy uh i'd spend a lot less time on things i would uh i would uh Uh, think about what we did. We made up a lot of it as we go. Uh, I would go straight to the idea of uh, I'd go with the actual. I'd, I'd launch with the product rather than just like who who wants to give me you know who wants to read my cartoon. I'd say well I'd, I'd actually start with the actual product. I wouldn't bother with just like who wants to read my cartoon. I would start with the actual product. Uh, and and then, and then everything you're creating helps and I, support that product. I, 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 yeah, yeah. As opposed to, I started. I started with. Uh, I started with cartoons, and then the products came afterwards. But I think I'd start with the product first, just because at least when you're selling a product, you know you know why you're having a conversation. You know, whereas you know, I think you can go down if you're just trying to meet people because you like them on social media. You can go down. There are a lot of rabbit holes to fall in. <laughs> you spend all your time talking about Hillary Clinton or whatever. You know. You know, no matter how much you talk about Hillary Clinton, you're still gonna you only get one vote. <laughs> Which is Hillary, pretty... it could be Bernie, it could be Donald Trump, who cares? But you only have one vote. I mean unless unless you want to be an activist, but I mean you know, it's like Well, Hugh the... First of all, thank yeah. you so much for, for coming on the on the show as well. It's been a delight kind of speaking to you and and getting your thoughts on things. I've been looking forward to this but, this conversation as well. And uh, share the best ways that obviously listeners can connect uh, with you and learn more about what you're working on. Uh, go to gapingvoid.com. Uh, I'll just do that and see what we're doing. Uh, subscribe to the newsletter, which is you can do that on the uh, on at Gaping Void. Uh, I just see what we're about. 
but you have a company that has a, a big cultural problem and you want to help get us to help you fix it, we're happy to talk. Awesome. So, well, sure. Thanks for coming on the show, Hugh, and I wish you all the best in the future projects. All right, terrific. All right, trio. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.